Good evening, UK Crime Book Club. Tonight, as T would say, my victim is Tony Millington. <laughs> so say hello to everyone, Tony, and tell us about oh, what you've been up to. Um, uh, yeah, I'm Tony. I'm normally on the other end of this, uh, firing questions at everybody else. And it's now <laughs> my turn to get, get through this side of it. Yeah, Tony Mellington, uh, now in Peterborough, originally from Russia. Um, and my first book um, for my new publisher, Dark Edge Press, came out a few weeks back called um, Family First. Um, it's, it's the first one in a series of four books at the moment, and another right in the pit. Mm. And it's a police procedural stroke detective um, series. Uh, introducing you to DS uh, Watson and Monty. Which are brilliant names. Pardon? You know, the brilliant names, aren't they? Watson and Monty, you can just kind of see the TV show. Yeah, um, the story behind that, um, I don't think they mind me telling you because I've got a, I had um, an acknowledgement in the back. It's where I was originally working when I first got the ideas for mm. the book. Um, was it? I was working in adult social care uh, for uh, an admin there, and two of the ladies, absolute brilliant ladies, they all were around there. Uh, two of the best friends were um, Kerry, Kerry Monty and Kerry Watson. Uh, and I just thought, yeah, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to use those two as the um, the main people uh, in in the box. Uh, it just it just seemed right at the time, and they do know about it, and they're quite happy with it. And have they read the book? Um, have they read the book? I don't know whether they've read them or not, but they know about it. Um, they were going to read it when, uh, but unfortunately, I moved. I finished with my last publisher about the same time that they were going to start reading it. So we do know now, I did, I've been in contact with them and so yeah, it's been republished in the Food Count Count. Um, if you want to uh, see what your alter ego is doing. <laughs> it's a great book. I think they'll be pretty chuffed with what their alter egos are up to. Thank you very much. <laughs> We've got some comments already. So um, Kaz has said hello and she has tagged Andrew and Leslie who um, have yeah, the message to say that the, she has... So, what is the fifth book about? I'm intrigued. Oh, the and somebody's one. just asked me the same. The fifth one that's about, it's just a continuation with the, after the first four. Um, I mean, you've read the first book and you know what the, what the ending for that is. So the second book really continues uh, how the first book ended. So the first book is family first. The second book uh, will be called Keep Your Friends Close. Uh, and, and when's that going to be released? That I was speaking to Louise Mullins at Sir uh, Dark Edge Press the other day and she said mm -hmm. we're looking at it. It's going to be around December now uh, before that comes out. Um, but the, the second book it follows on straight after the first book. Um, but now and then the other ones just continue with that with um, new uh, crimes to be solved and um, things that they get involved in um, and it's just a continuation um, of the life of a, of a detective. They're quite a pair aren't they as well? They have a lot of yeah. fun, they've really yeah. got each other's backs and they're really kind of, they're really good mates, they've had a long long friendship so they're really in tune with each other yeah i wanted to do that because there's, there's quite a lot of um detective series out there also on the tv of um, the loner detective who's got a load of troubles behind him and fighting things and fighting demons mm. um it just when i first started it it, it, it felt right to be um a pair of detectives who have grown up together um, and have got each other's backs and the families know each other and the, the, the families get on to well together. But then they, they do have their odd uh, one or two things that they need to um, 
I've gone all dark because of the. You did go all well dark for a second. Um, we do have our own little things to get involved with throughout the uh, throughout the book. Uh, one which appears straight away in book one and everything. So, ooh, I've got oh, my son. My son's gone. I don't know. <laughs> Oh, that's a bit oh there you go, that's better. I'm sorry about this. That's all right, that's live stuff for it's you. Live TV books. <laughs> Is that better? Yeah. I can see your lovely face now. Thank you. Mm. Um so oh Leslie's struggling with your audio feed. So Leslie's struggling to hear you. We did have some um, some technical gremlins, didn't we, before we got going? Yeah. So stay leaned in and let's see if that helps. Mm. Kaz's favourite question to ask, would you make a graphic novel of one of your books? I know who that is without even having to look on my phone to see who Facebook user is. So are you into graphic novels? Uh, no. I've not read any graphic novels at all. Um, I read the only, I only read very few comics when I was younger, but I haven't been into any of that at all. Uh, it's just not appealed to me. Uh, but if somebody wants to have a go at writing a graphic novel, I don't know whether they can do that, it. I think so. I think it's quite visual. I think there's a lot to, yeah, a lot to work with. So I have to see if somebody wants to get in touch and do the drawing. I assume that you don't fancy doing the drawing yourself. I'm not going to draw it. Don't worry about that. So we're not going to have a stick pen one. I leave the, I leave the visualisation for the readers. <laughs> I just want the word. Um, she also wants to know if you're going to Harrogate, which is this weekend. It starts tomorrow. Yes. No, I'm not going. Unfortunately, not. Um, I did, and I was all booked up until they um, did their extra bits for COVID and uh, yeah, having to pay to go on site. So mm. once that happened, there was not something else that I was going to do. Um, so unfortunately, I've cancelled everything, and then hopefully we can go next year. So I've noticed um, that the uh, things are still available for. Crime Fest down in Bristol for next year. So we've taken a look for going down there for in May. Um, and the other arts books are, are bed and breakfast already. Um, so either way, you get a nice looking. weekend away. Pardon? Either way, you're going to get a nice weekend away. Bristol way, is nice gorgeous. Weekend. So whether it's at the moment, it's still on, but you know what life is at the moment. So yeah. It, Unpredictable at best. Yeah. Um, Jay wants to know, Jason Kelly, another one of our admins, what did you do before writing? So you've talked a bit about it. What did I do? What didn't I do? Um, the main one was um, I did 15 years as a civil servant in the MOD. Um, as what we call is a... Um, equipment manager so buying um, uh, equipment from uh, our suppliers for all fly services mainly for the RAF uh, but also a little bit for the Navy and a little bit for the Army, for the Army. Um, and then uh, so I worked at the majority of all the RAF bases around Peterborough the main one being at RAF Whitton down near Huntingdon mm. Um, that was brilliant. I absolutely thoroughly enjoyed that. And then, like I said, I had to take um, redundancy from them after about 15 years because they were going through a load of changes and everything. And um, I found it was better um, to take the redundancy and then see what else I could do. Oh. So um, I ended up, after about a year and a half, I ended up doing some year, uh, about four years in um, working with the council in Peterborough in either children's services or adult social services doing the admin around there. Um, before that, I've been here, there and everywhere with a judge. 
the one that you actually did, I did actually say about when you were speaking to Caroline England, and yes, I was a lifeguard out in the water. A lifeguard? A lifeguard. That, that was interesting. That was very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> There's got to be inspiration for stories from that job. Uh, yeah, it could be. Um, um, yeah, it's quite eye-opening and quite revealing, <laughs> shall we say. <laughs> Revealing's one word for working on a beach, I would imagine. Oh, yes. <laughs> if you think the Germans are bad enough at uh, putting uh, towels on uh, sun lounges, um, the hotel I was working at was the Brits only, and they do it. I don't see the point. <laughs> just seems like a lot of stress to sit on a sun, lan a sun lounger. I just, mm. nah, go with the flow. <laughs> Make it mm. easier. Um, Kaz wants to know, would you ever set a novel in a different country? Would I set one in a different country? I don't know at the moment. Um, all my novels are being set in and around. Um, it's a fictitious town called uh, West Ravenswood. But it is based roughly on Peterborough, at least in mm. Peterborough. Um, I did it that way because um, when I first started out back in writing these, back in 2016, 17, um, there was two very, no very well-known uh, writers who should be well-known around here, to, uh, Mr. Tony Forder and uh, Ross Greenwood. Mm. They'd already, they were starting coming out with uh, their novels uh, based in Peterborough, and um, I thought, hang on a minute, um, I didn't, I didn't feel confident enough, to, confident enough to do Peterborough myself. So what I did is basically make a um, a fantasy, a made up uh, town and city, but loosely based on Peterborough. Uh, and West Ravenswood is based. The names come from two areas of Peterborough, which is Westwood and Ravenswood, so I just amalgamated the two names together. Has anybody ever spotted anywhere that's a real location in your books? Um, they're not real locations, but there's one or two bits and pieces. That kind of based on it. things, though. Um, I know that there's one or two that have said the, uh, the pub in the beginning, the, the uh, Dragon's Den. I did base that on a couple of pubs that I actually did frequent when I was younger. Hmm. Uh, so there's one or two people that actually do know me that know, oh yeah, I recognise the pub from there, I just don't know it very well. Um, but the others, I'm just using names from around the area, I've just changed a few names around um, to, um, um, just to help out a little bit. I know when uh, we had Peter James on a few weeks ago and um, I'm sure it was Peter that said he came a cropper because somebody said he murdered somebody in my house. So now they find out what the last street number is on a house and yeah, make sure I, that it's a fictitious I, I, number. I saw that. Was it Peter James? Am I remembering that it was right? Peter James, yeah. Um, it's a it good way of doing it, though, isn't it? Barrett, or Barrett. Um, but yeah, that was Peter James that was saying that, yeah at me actually remembering something for once never happens yeah i've changed i've changed uh, um straight names and just made pushing straight names and everything so it's just not but i am thinking of uh maybe um doing another series sometime in the future but we're based in peter or somewhere else mm. like i said I'm, I'm originally from up in cheshire was around warrington and lake yeah so i'm of doing something around there or where my parents live in Rutland or somewhere around there. Um, but I haven't made a decision on that yet. What about um, writing a standalone? Do you ever fancy doing that? Um, nothing's come to mind as yet. I'm just still, um, my mind's still working with uh, Monty oh. and Watson at the moment. But maybe, but we'll see what happens. Maybe something on a beach in Carthay. <laughs> Nice to be <laughs> um, Jason wants to know, do you set yourself a daily word target? So tell us about your writing, just your writing life in general. Do you write every day? 
Um, not every day. It all depends whether I'm um, I'm in the mood for it. Um, I do try and try and write most days, but it doesn't mm. always come out. So it all depends on what I'm doing that day and everything. But with um, the fourth book, um, the first three for Dark Age Press were already written, and I'd already started writing the fourth book. I was about five thousand words into it. But I was struggling with those 5,000 words because we'd just gone into lockdown and my writing module disappeared. But once oh. I got the contract from Dark Edge Press and they gave me a deadline of, for that one, it would have been June just past, um, then I had to write virtually every day to do that. Um, so I try and do some write, try and do some writing. I try and work myself around 500 words for a day. Mm. If I get over 500 words, it's it's, it's a good day. Um, the other day, I think I did about 800 or something like that. Leslie, um, Leslie Lloyd has said hello. Um, Leslie, we can actually see your comments. I don't know why um, why you think they're not sending. So, um, comments away. I can see what you're writing. So, must be some technical difficulties at your end, Leslie, but. Yeah, we can um, can see what you're writing. So get help me to grill Tony. Oh, Andrew, you're leaving comments too. So it seems there's some problem. Um, a few people are thinking that they're not leaving comments, but they are coming up. We can yeah. see them. So ask away. Yeah, I can see quite a few comments coming down there. Somebody has asked what authors have been an influence on your writing. That's Jason as well. Uh, authors. Um, I don't try and base what I'm writing on other authors, but I've been oh. really, I started off right, um, reading, when I got back into reading, um, with James Patterson first. So I read the majority of James Patterson, then uh, I went on to uh, Lee Childs oh. and read the majority of the Reacher books. Um, we're one or two authors, and now it's... Um, some of the authors that I've, uh, I've found and got got to know uh, through UK crime books and other places, uh, like Tony Ford and Malcolm Holland um, oh. and the like. But I don't really base my writing on anybody else's. It's just whatever comes into my head and how it spills out onto the page. And now, when um, when I was reading Family First. One of the things that struck me, and it's hard to talk about, isn't it, without giving things away. So there are a lot of a lot of twists. Yes. And the way that things are woven together is yes. really cleverly done. Thank you. So how difficult is that to balance and to manage getting that right? Um I think it's I don't plan anything. It's uh, I'm always I'm really, baffled when people say they can write something like that without any planning at all. No, uh, no wow. planning at all. Um, I'm more, I am a, a panster. I mean, I knew, I knew what, how I wanted to start it, which was mm. um, what happened in the first chapter. And it's not going to be a giveaway because it happens straight No, away. first chapter, yeah, go for it. Like somebody gets killed in um, the back of a pub in the car park. Um, so I already knew that's where I wanted it to start, um, and I already knew the names of the um, who the protagonist is and the name of um, the detective, and then I just built it on from there. It's just a case of right, well, he's killed, them, he's disappeared, off, they've come in, and then I just take it a chapter at a time where I think the um, the story is going to go. Uh, and build it up from there. There's there's no planning into it. It's just whatever comes out of it comes out of my head at the time. So I do never you write it down as what I'm going to write? Do you write it in order? Or yes, I try to. When you get to the end, though, do you think, oh right, I'll go back and I'll weave that bit in because that works really well based on what's happened now? Um, no, what I do is I. I do a certain amount, then I go back and re-edit that. That's how I've started to do it now. Um, and so I get to about 10,000 words, go back, re-edit what I've done, 
but I don't change the story. Mm. Uh, I build it up and expand it a bit, but I don't actually change it. I'm just going to go back to Andrew because, um, Andrew, I can see that you say, it says you can't send a question, Caroline. Um, and when you start it, it says something went wrong. It's still coming through, so I really don't know what is happening, but they are definitely coming through. We can see the comments on here. Whether that's Be Live or Facebook, no idea, but send it and um, we can see it. I know that Andrew likes to ask about um, whether books are available on audio and whether they're available in libraries. Right, at the moment, uh, Family First is only available on ebook. Um, I spoke to Louise at the publisher um, the other day, and she's told me that they are looking to uh, do the pre order for the paperback pretty soon. And Excellent. that should be hitting um, Amazon and all that by the 20th of September. There's a deadline for that. Um, e um, audio books, um, I don't think they're doing audio books at this moment in time. Um, and so, and unfortunately, people are going to have to wait. But what I can say is that um, the book that Family First, I originally did it as um, Unsilent Grief. And I went back when I changed uh, publishers, I went back and I, I I added a few bits and pieces to it, mm. but I think you can still get the audio book of Unsilent Grief uh, on Amazon. I did uh, notice it on your Amazon when I looked. Yeah, the, it was when I got my rights back for the two books that they mm -hmm. published, Unsilent Grief, and it was, the second book was originally called Friends Close, Enemies Closer. Um, I got the rights back to the actual e-books and the paper book. Um, but the audio book was on a different um, a different contract. So that has actually stayed with Britain's next bestseller, which is a publisher. And they've had it for, they've got it for five years. I think they've got about another two years, another two, two years to run on that. Um, but like I said, when Dark Edge Press took over the first two books, they said yeah, immediately we will reprint and reissue those first two books. But when mm. we were doing it, we need to, uh, as a legality, we need to change the title and the front cover, uh, Total Row, uh, which is what they're going to, which is what they've done for the first one, they're going to do for the second one. But and yeah. it's nice, isn't it, to have a cohesive cover. Obviously, when you change publisher, the, the cover does often, more often than not, it does change and the title changes. Um, I, I do remember coming across the words family first towards the end of the book and thinking it's really yeah. nice when the words are in the book. It doesn't yeah, always yeah. work out like that and that's fine as well. Yeah, that's why I, I chose those, um, I chose the uh, titles, the, the two past books and this one. Mm. Um, they, they, they're actually um, somewhere in the books you'll find those those words uh, and, one or two yeah, words. silent grief is actually written somewhere yeah. so you could have a play on on silent grief for the original title yeah yeah you actually find you actually find the people actually saying some of those words um it's different for what will be book three and book four um because i've just done use the general um a general over uh, cover uh, title for both of those books, but they do they do seem to um, it's a good title for both of those books, I should say. How difficult was it writing um, a police team? It's just something that it just popped into my my head to say this is what I want to do mm. because we we've, we've always. Um, Ever since we were young and then going through marriage and everything, is we've just we've watched all the police police procedurals and on the TV, um, whether it's um, CSI or going all the way back to Juliet Bravo and Deb Jars and all that lot, and then through to the new ones that are coming out now. 
Um, so we've all got um, green police stuff is um, has been in my blood most of the time. And it's the one that I felt more comfortable to write to write on. Um, I can't see myself doing anything like that. I know we're big into um, Star Trek and all that lot, but I can't. I haven't got the um, the brain capacity, shall we say, to uh, to think up um, fantasy stuff or things like that. Um, but yeah, I was more comfortable with doing the police procedural ones. And Donna's just come in and said, hi, Sam. Hi, Tony. Hi, Donna. So we're definitely getting comments coming through. Have you frozen on my screen now? Donna, you've jinxed it. <laughs> I'm going to be start talking to myself. No, I've not got any sound or anything. Tony, refresh your screen and let's um, let's see what happens. Fact. Oh, and he's gone. Hello, everyone. Well, I wasn't expecting that. It was all going so well, so swimmingly well. Hello. Have you missed me? <laughs> Hello. Sam. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Sam should rejoin soon. Uh, hopefully, everyone will re. Um, Refinders, it should be getting repinned. Do you want to just recap where you got to with Sam? Um, I don't know where we did get this. <laughs> I don't know what we did after that. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what we did. Do you sort of done your introduction to yourself and your books? Yeah, I've done that with everything about it, about half way through. Uh, yeah, reintroduction to me again. Uh, I'm Tony Nainton. I'm uh, originally from uh, up in Cheshire, but now I'm residing in Peterborough. Um, my first book for my new publisher, Dark Age Press, uh, was published uh, a couple of weeks back on ebook called uh, Family First. Uh, and it's a piece procedural um, with the um, main people being uh, D.S. Watson and Ron Pete. So, uh, how much research did you have to do for the police procedures? Um, not a lot, actually. I mostly came out of my own head, but there are a few bits and pieces that I had to uh, look through Google to make sure that I, I had it correct, which was the um, the police ranks was definitely one of them that I, I looked on on Google to make sure that. Uh, I got everything all correct with that. Um, and then it, all it was was um, I was looking, I looked into um, uh, one, of the, one of the ones that I, I looked in memory was the one of uh, with, um, what happened to a body when it gets uh, submerged underwater uh, as a body and what how it reacts to everything, uh, which was quite, quite interesting to read about. Nice. Uh, we've got Sam. Here, oh, here we go. Hello. Hello. <laughs> well, what a disaster that was. I've no no idea how long I was talking to myself for. I was talking absolute nonsense. Thank you, Cass. I don't All know right. what happened. I shall be off. Probably part of it. Mm -hmm. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe that was part of the glitch that everybody else was having, and then suddenly everything froze and. I was talking to myself. So what has the lovely Caroline just been asking you? Um, about research. Oh, okay. And what about experts as well? That leads nicely onto the other question I was going to ask you about experts. Um, anything to do with uh, the medical side. Um, I've got my wife to do. She's a, an ex-nurse and she's worked, she used to work for the NHS for over 30 years. Um, and the, the prison bits, um, 
uh, was friend, uh, the couple of um, people that I know that were in the prison service, uh, Ross Greenwood being one of them. Um, and they helped me out with doing one or two things to do with the, with the prison service and um, what happens behind the scenes with the prison. Um, Have you had to so use any artistic who... license with it? What's that? Have you had to use any artistic license with any of the um, any of the procedures? Um, no, I try and I look up as much as I can in the way of the police procedures and how things go on, um, and uh, try and work it around those um, and do it and, and do it that way, just to make sure that I know that. Um, if somebody comes and has read the book and say, no, that's incorrect, that's incorrect, that shouldn't be there. Um, just, just to make sure that I've got, I know what what should be going in the book and what shouldn't be. Yep, that's fair enough. So when, um, when you're writing, how long did the first, I know you did it as On Silent Grief and then you've made a handful of changes, like you said. Yeah. Um, how long did that take from start to finish, the, the first well, draft was, of what um, has become Family First? When I was, yeah, when I was working it as um, On Silent Grief, it took the best part of a year because it's my first time that I'd actually done it. So uh, you've I'm never written, to, there's no books before that, just in a drawer like anywhere? No, wow. I haven't written like that before. Um, the only real writing that, that became public I've done uh, was uh, writing for little bits and pieces for the uh, local paper for the sports section. Uh -huh. um, it was called the Western Mercury at the time. Um, not Western Mercury, my apologies for that. It was the Stamford Mercury in Lincolnshire. And we border on uh, Lincolnshire and, and Rutland. Um, so what we're doing, I, I was, was uh, I was a um, secretary of the local pool league in Rutland. So I used to send off uh, every week uh, the results and a little bit for them. And then during the summer, I did for the local cricket club I was playing for, the Corrigan and Wake Club, and put the results through for them and doing a little bit for that. So they appeared every so often in the evening. But that's the only public writing I've actually ever done. Wow. So how much um, real life has gone into, you know, real life experience? Maybe not characters and people, although there's bound to be a little bit of you in there somewhere, I would imagine. Um, Donna's back and hoping she's not going to jinx it again. <laughs> um, there's one or two things that are actually cropping up in any of, in all the books that um, I do. I mean, the... the, the um, when I explain things about um, West Ravenwood and how it built up into a town from a town to a city, that's more like based on what Peterborough was like. Mm. Um, there's a bit that's going to be in to be in book three um, that I've got the information from when I was um, one of the infamous uh, white van mans doing delivery driving uh, around the back around about. So. Mm. Um, there's a bit about um, the back on how parcels get from one place to another, the uh, what's called the trunkers and everything going overnight to, to places on, on that. So I've used that as, a, as part of the backstory for uh, in the book three. Um, but mainly, yeah, there may be those are the, those are the types of things that I've put in from um, life, ex life experience. Is there anything that you'd like to research? So, I don't know, when you were talking about the, you know, driving long distance and things, made me think of um, Ice World Truckers. That oh, must yeah. be a hell of a job. Yeah. Is there anything, I mean, I'm not suggesting that you go to Alaska mm -hmm. and become an Ice World Trucker for research, but is there anything that you'd really like to actually physically do to research it to see what it's like? Um, nothing at the present moment in time, no. Um, so it's just things that uh, that come to my mind that I might, might have done. Um, like I said, with the in the fifth book, there's a little bit that's going to be uh, something about adult social services uh, in the fifth book. 
Um, and I said, I, I used to work for children and adult social services, mm. not as a social worker, but mainly for an admin side of it, if anything. But yeah, um, you know, I, did, I have picked up quite a bit of stuff from there. So that's going to be in, in book five. But uh, there's nothing that I could get uh, as I would say, I want to do that just for the research, just for research. Because I never know what I'm going to be writing about when I sit down and write it. Yeah, it fair comes enough. into my head at the time. Um, what about the last scene that you wrote? What was the last thing? It's my new favourite question. I don't know where it came from. Mm -hmm. But what was the last scene that you wrote, if you can say it without giving anything away? No, it's fine. Um, I was writing it actually before I started this, and uh, that scene in Monty, like I said, there, it's um, about adult social services, and they had uh, just a bit, they had just arrived at the council offices, um, and Monty, a lady had uh, been found uh, murdered um, in and around West Ravenswood, and she, uh, we found out she was a social worker. So the, the piece I'm writing now is they're actually going, going to see uh, their, her work colleague uh, to get more, a little bit more background on it. One of the questions I meant to ask before is, have you ever actually acted a scene out? Have I ever? Acted a scene out, you know, just to check that the, the dynamics of it work, how you think they'll work, and just to help you get it onto the page. I don't act it out, but I try and visualise it in my head. Uh, just to make sure that I know um, that it is actually going to work. Um, if, I, if I see it in my head first and people talking to people or what the action is going to be, then it, it normally works out quite well on the, on the page. Um, there was a bit that's in the fourth book about um, there's a, a, a foot chase around a um, scrapyard. So I'm actually visualising that taking place going on track about who's going to be where and how they're going to get from one place to another. And that was quite fun. That was quite fun now. I'm getting, I'm assuming this is Carl's. Thank you, Caroline Maston, our Lord and Saviour tonight, definitely. Um, so are your books set in Peterborough? But we know they are loosely based on Peterborough. I once sat on Peterborough train station during an eclipse. I don't know who that's from. I wonder if that's um, somebody else that she's asking that for. They are loosely based around Peterborough. Um, as I said before, it's um, uh, because of uh, there are other writers that uh, live in Peterborough that um, have taken, are doing their Peterborough a bit. Mm. So, because I was new into writing, um, the um, I thought it'd be better if I did it um, with a fictitious, a fictitious plot. So there's another question that asks if you know Tony Forder, which leads nicely oh, yes. into another question that I was thinking. Oh um, yes, I know Tony Forder. You... And how important has this online support network been during everything that's happened? Yeah, we we, um, we talk to each other every so often um, and maybe bounce a few ideas off each other, both with mm. Tony, uh, with Malcolm um, and Ross Greenwood. Um, yeah, I've met uh, Tony a nice on a couple group of occasions and also, also Ross as well. And I met um, Malcolm up in at Harrogate when it was last done in 2019. Um, but yeah, we, know, we talk quite regularly on, uh, on on Facebook. Because that must have been important with everything stopping, all the live events stopped, all the face-to-face -face things stopped, just going for, you know, a walk or a, a pint or anything, everything just stopped. So this mm -hmm. online thing has been really useful, hasn't it? Um, when we first went into lockdown, um, I think it did affect, it did affect me. I mean, I'm... I'm I suffer from mental health anyway, um, and um, I couldn't go out of the house before that, so not going out of the house after it was, um, I was climbing the walls, mm. um, and because of that, the majority of the time my writing stopped, 
from my writing mojo stuff because you just can't be bothered. You could just couldn't think about doing anything at the time. Um, so yeah, uh, talking to people on on, on Facebook uh, was a godsend. Yeah. And you doing you doing things like this, um, keeping people abreast of everything, um, yeah, that definitely helped. It's good to hear. I know it's helped me. It helped my mental health massively. Um, it's provided, I mean, the life changing power of a book club. I mean, what yeah. can I say? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm like I said, uh, my mental health has, uh, for a few years has been very bad. Um, and I managed to get uh, some help through a club called Andy's Man Club. I've seen, and actually, I think you were the person who introduced me, obviously, not me, yeah. but have been able to share that around with other people because yeah, I saw you share around There's a couple of places in them. Manchester that do it, but there's one in Peterborough, and I've been using it for almost three years. Um, and it's a good place for men to go and talk their, talk their life stresses out. Um, mm. And it has helped me quite. It has helped me a lot uh, with the lockdown. When the first lockdown happened, all that stopped. And what they did was go online and do things like this. And you, you have a, a visual. Um, it helped. It didn't. It wasn't like actually meeting face to face. Yeah. But now, when I mean, we started meeting up before last Christmas again. We were allowed to. Um, but now it's gone back to where it should be now, and um, everybody, it's, it's, it's just a godsend with it. I can imagine, yeah, I can absolutely imagine. And it's wonderful having things online, but it's really good that things like mental health, health, youth clubs, were allowed to continue in some capacity, because there was so much stripped from so many people. Yeah. Um, and also the importance, I mean, we will go back to books in a minute, but yeah. the important thing is that there's so many people that are just at home anyway. This isn't hasn't been a massive difference for them. So suddenly yeah. people are finding this online support that they've never had access to before. No. And hopefully some of it will stay. Yes, it would do. Um, but yeah, um, if I can do a plug, is it? Absolutely. If there is any... If there is any if there are any men out there that are um, suffering or are there any um, female partners who know their men are suffering with it, please come on to line and look up Andy's Man Club. We've got about, oh, we've got, let's count as 55 clubs up and down the country. And we meet on a Monday night for two hours to just natter away. You don't have to talk if you don't have to. Uh, but just to talk right through life stresses, it could be anything that you're going through. Uh, just come and help. Come and, we, there's a lot of help out there. There is, and it's that step to finding it, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Absolutely. And after our 10 minute break that we managed to um, flap our way through, <laughs> um, we've got five minutes left. I can so... handle if you want me to anymore. <laughs> Seeing as, we got so, ten, seeing as we were 10 minutes down. Let's see what other questions we may have missed. Loving the fancy hair, lovely Sam. Thank you. Thank you. I had my hair cut yesterday because I booked it months ago for Harrogate, which I'm not going to now. But um, I, I booked a haircut, which I've been, I've had a teasing message from my, um, from my boss saying about hair blowing in the breeze. I've, it's cooled down a bit now, so the fan's off so that I could hear you better. And fancy nails, <laughs> they don't last, they won't last long. As soon as they come off, I'll be biting my own nails again. We've got lots of hellos again. Um, so Andrew wants to know if he can find your work on Kindle. So obviously, yes, which is yeah. where I've read Family First. Yeah, Kindle, yeah. It's only Family First that's available on Kindle at the moment. The other two were taken off Kindle because I changed the publisher. And it took me about six months to um, to get involved with Dark Edge Press. Um, I've sent off quite a load of... Once I left um, the first publisher, um, I sat down and wrote out a good email and, and 
covering letters and everything and just whacked them out to um, to other publishers and to agents. Um, I never got a few came back said thank you but no thank you and everything. Um, and I got involved. <laughs> I found out about um, Vanity Press, Vanity Publishing as well at the time. Um, where, yeah, we can publish it, but only if you pay for it. Um, no. Nope. So that, that, that we keep those. I keep those to the side. Hmm. Um, and Dark Edge Press. I saw an advert for them on on Facebook. Um, I was self isolating at the time because I was going to the hospital for an operation. Mm. And I saw them on Facebook, um, they were just setting up and everything else like that. So I'd set a, I'd, I'd sent them the email and the manuscript for uh, and Silent People before death and thought nothing of it. And then about three quarters of an hour later, I got a ping on the email and I thought, oh, okay, and so it's from Dark Edge Press. And um, Louise Mullins had written an absolute belter of a, an email for me. So, um, we skim readed your um, manuscript uh, and we absolutely love it. And I've passed it across mm -hmm. to Michael Norman, who does with the contract and everything. Um, and he should be getting in contact with you pretty soon. Soon, I thought. Okay, jaw dropped down to the floor and everything else like that. I, I showed the email to the wife, said, Are you sure that I'm reading this correctly? Mm -hmm. And about an hour later, Michael's e email turned up and said, um, Yeah, I hear you've got um, two books that have been published, and then you've got a third one, and you're, all, you're working on a fourth. So, because of that, um, we'd like to offer you a four book contract there and then. Um, less than what three hours between start and finish, um, and he sent me the contract, a lot through it, and signed it the next day. Uh, and I've not looked back since. Um, Louis, both Louise, Malcolm, and the other people that work for them have been absolutely brilliant, uh, and that's why I'm here now with um, Family Bird. And it's just fantastic when it all falls yeah. into place. Yeah. It's a wonderful so, thing. To answer Andy, and is it Andrew's question? Yeah, it's only on uh, Kindle at the moment. Um, 20th of September is the, de is the date penciled in to have it out on paperback. Uh -huh. um, audio, I'm not too sure when that will be. Um, and book two should be out, uh, fingers crossed on Kindle in December I and mean, I've loosely been told because um, we're still still going through the edits. Mm. Well I will drop a link in um, under our conversation at the end mm. so that um, so it's easy to find for everybody and it's, yeah. it's a great book. I've, seen, I've, I've really seen, enjoyed it. I've seen the uh, cover for um, Keep Your Friends Close and it is brilliant. Uh, Jamie at uh, Dark Edge Press with itself and tells you about doing both the covers at the moment. Mm. It is lovely when everybody's happy with the whole thing. It just works. So once you've picked yourself um, up off the floor after you read your email and got your contract, yeah. how did you celebrate? I couldn't celebrate because I was um, in self-isolation. Um, and I had to go in for a, an operation down in London uh, a few days later. Mm. And I was on a strict diet as well. Um, so it was not a case to celebrate. It was having to celebrate a little bit afterwards. So um, it wasn't a lot of celebration, but it was just a case of walking the holiday. Do you know, I sometimes think just sitting outside for an hour and you know, in the sun or in the shade, as as I do, because I can't go in the sun. Um, just sitting out and just having an hour just to sit and think about what you've achieved is as big a celebration as any other. It is. It's um, it's a wonder I've got there. It's a wonder of where I am at the moment because I never thought anything like this is going to happen. I think most people, most authors who start out doing this. Um, yeah, they fantasise or do something and say, yeah, I want to be, um, 
to see the, the big people in the uh, industry um, getting what they are. But to, to actually get there, one, it's very, very hard. And two, there's a hell of a lot of luck that is involved in it. Um, somebody else said that, I think you might, I don't know whether it was Peter James or somebody else, but said that there was a lot of luck involved in, um, in, the, in the publishing industry. Um, you've got right to be place, right in the time. right place at the right time. Yeah. Um, Andrew says, thanks, Tony. All success. Thank Ross you. Greenwood says, good luck, Tone. Thank you, Ross. <laughs> and his books are flying off the shelves as well at the moment. He's been, he's been doing some very good books. I've read most of them. Um, I haven't read the, la the latest one, uh, The Prisoner, of all, so, um, that's still to be done. But my, all those early books have been brilliant. There you go. Gone by Ross Greenwood as well. Yeah. And yeah. everybody else that we've mentioned. And on that note, I think it's time to give everyone a final recap of Family First. And then we'll drop a link in afterwards. Yeah. Family First is uh, the first of a series uh, of four books at the moment. This one I'm writing at the moment, writing now. Um, it follows um, DS Watson and DS Monteith uh, from the West Ravenswood um, Criminal Detective Agency. Uh, and in the first book, they are they have got a serial killer on the loose. Um, so it's a different way, different way of looking at a serial killer. Um, yeah. I've written it not just in the police side of it, but it's in the mind of the serial killer himself. Um, he didn't want to become what he's become. It's just um, life has thrown him some curveballs and been a complete wrap back to it. Um, and he's um, dealing with things in his own in his own way. Um, uh, it's up to the police to try and uh, fathom out who this person is and stop him before he's got to this, uh, what he wants to do right at the end. Well, thank you so much for bearing with us and joining us in, and for two interviews tonight. You've had me, <laughs> yeah. you've had me twice and you've had Kaz in, in between. Um, oh. Thank you to everyone for moving over with us and for all the questions before and after. And thank you for Kaz stepping in. Yeah, thanks, Kaz. Thanks for everybody for watching. And um, we'll see you next time for um, for book two and beyond. Thank you, Tony. It's been lovely. Yeah, thank you very much, Sam. And thank you for everybody. <laughs>